president of the Helms Center, you're in for a treat this evening. This is the inaugural lecture in the Albert and Christine Henley Leadership Series. You'll see that, uh, that name on your program. Uh, programs are uh, at the door as you came in. Would the family who made this speaker series possible please stand so we can recognize you? Thank you all so much. Let's give them a hand. On the back of your program, you'll see a brief biography of uh, tonight's speaker, Andrew Puzder, and here to make the formal induction is the president of the Helm Center, Brian Rogers. Uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, good evening, everybody. I appreciate the generous introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. I I'm going to get. Um, I want to get. I want to tell you a little bit more about myself uh, before I get into talking about free market capitalism, because I think it's important for you to understand why it's important for me to be here today. I, I did run a uh, an international restaurant corporation for about 17 years. Uh, it, but but really, I'm just a uh, a working class kid from Cleveland, Ohio. My, my grandfather came to this country in the early 1900s from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and ended up working construction. You can see him here uh, in front of a truck, in front of a house in the early 1920s. My dad was a, car, was a Ford car salesman when I was growing up uh, outside of Cleveland. We, you know, we were, he was a World War II combat vet, but ended up selling cars. It, we were just a working class family. But you really didn't think about being a working class family back then. That's not the way people thought of themselves. I mean, everybody seemed to be working class. The kids in school were working class. The kids on TV were working class. Working class just seemed to be the way things were, at least for me, until one day my dad asked me to go with him to deliver a car to a very wealthy man uh, in a very wealthy area near where we lived. It was just a few miles away, but really it was like a different world. So I was 10 years old, it was 1960, and we, I went with my dad, we pull up to this, uh, this man's front gate, and he's got this huge gate. At least in my mind, it's a huge gate. I was 10 years old, I probably went back now, it'd be like you know, a little gate. But back then, it seemed like this massive gate. It probably was the biggest gate I ever saw, because it was probably the only gate I ever saw. Anyway, the gate opens, and there's this beautiful white house. You know, it's, it's sunset, it's, it's glow, the sun's glowing off it, the, the lawn is perfectly manicured. You know, the flower beds are perfect. The driveway, you know, looks like something special. E everything about this house said wealthy. So my dad's driving the car, and he pulls up in front of me. He turns off to the right to go back around behind it. I said, wait. I said, Dad, what, you know, why, did you, why didn't you stop? I wanted to see the house. He looked down and said, son, that was the guest house. <laughs> so we kept driving. We went by uh, the stable. There were these stables. It was, uh, it was a, as I said, it was a very rich area. It's called Hunting Valley. And there was a lot of hunting, the fox hunting, there was polo. But we drive by these stables and there's, you know, these people working for the horse. The, the stables were gorgeous. They were, they, actually, the stables looked better than the little ranch house my, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister and I lived in at that point. We kept driving. We come to this, this huge, huge house, really just a, a mansion. And again, I was 10 years old. Who knows what it looks like today? But to me, it was like Downton Abbey. It was just this huge, huge place. We pull up front. My dad walks up brings the doorbell, talking to Mr. Humphrey. He and Mr. Humphrey were friends. It was the individual that owned it was named George Humphrey. And uh, they talked for a little bit, and I'm looking around. I'm just, I'm just wowed. I mean, almost unable to comprehend the incredible wealth that's surrounding me. And there's the fields with the horses and the guest house and the main house. And the... So my dad finishes talking to Mr. Humphrey. We walk, we're walking back to the trade-in that Mr. Humphrey was going to make. He was giving us his old car, and we were leaving him with the new Ford. Back then, even rich guys drove Fords. So we went to the old, we took the old car, and we, my dad's got the keys, and we're walking to it. I, 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 said, I said, Dad, what, you know, what does Mr. Humphrey do that, that he can live like this? And my dad said, well, he's a, he's a lawyer, and he owns a business. And I can remember thinking like it was yesterday. You know, a lawyer, 
know, I, I could be a lawyer. Now, now, I think it's important that I thought that, but I think what's more important is what I didn't think. What I didn't think was, that son of a bitch is stealing from us. You know, he's in the 1%, and we're in the whatever percent you're in when your dad sold cars in the, in the 1960s. Now, what I thought was I could do that, and, and, and thank God, I lived in a country where I could do that. Now, the country that my grandfather had grown up in, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was no path to success. For me, there was, there was a path to success. Right now, it was an arduous path. It wasn't an easy path. I worked, to get through college and law school, I worked every dirty job you could think of. I had no family support, no government support. You know, I, I cut lawns, I painted houses. One summer, if anybody ever lived in St. Louis? Well, summers here are probably like summers in St. Louis. One summer in St. Louis, I busted up concrete with a jackhammer and threw the chunks on the back of a truck to try and make enough money to support myself and my family. It, uh, I had a wife and two kids by the time I graduated from law school. I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis back in 1978. But I finally made it. So, so why, why do I tell you this? Well, it, it's because eventually, eventually I succeeded. Eventually I became a lawyer and I ran a company. Uh, this is uh, that guy with the hair and the kid on his shoulders. That's me when I had hair. The kid on my shoulders is now 47 years old, and he's a lawyer. He runs a tech company in, uh, in Arizona where he's always broke every month. That's my, that, my, the boy in the bottom right is my son Aaron, who's now one of our nation's nuclear physicists and has two kids of his own. That's my sister with his hand, her hand on his head, and that guy that looks like a car salesman there, that's my father, the car salesman. I eventually became a lawyer and then uh, ran a company that owned Hardee's and uh, Carl's Jr., uh, we had about 4,000 restaurants in 40 countries across the world in 45 states domestically. That one up there is in Saudi Arabia. I don't remember where that picture was taken, but it's probably in California. And as I said, we did about $4 billion in, re in revenue the last year that I was CEO of that company. I, you know, there's never been another country in the history of the world where a working class kid like me could have aspired to that level of success with any realistic chance of achieving it. Had I, had I been born in a socialist country you know, or a country that didn't really respect my freedom to succeed, the idea of lifting myself to the working class or an, out of the working class to another class would have either seemed an impossible dream or never would have occurred to me at all. Now, I didn't become successful because I was greedy or I was jealous of Mr. Humphrey. I, didn't be, I wasn't jealous of Mr. Humphrey. I wanted to be like Mr. Humphrey. I think we all want to succeed. We all want to do better in our lives. You wouldn't be at this school. You wouldn't be in this room if you didn't want to improve your life. The question is, is there a moral way to improve your life? Is there a moral way that you can make yourself better off than your parents were or than you, or than you are currently? What I'm going to propose to you is that the best and most moral way for you to improve your life and to move forward lies in free market capitalism. Now, how can I say that? You hear so much in the news and you read it in the papers and you've probably been told in high school and college that capitalism is based on greed and it's really socialism that, that's benevolent. But I want you to think about that for a minute because how do you succeed in a capitalist economy? How do you succeed in a free market economy? There's only one way you can succeed. You have to meet the needs of other people. In a capitalist economy, you can only succeed if you provide the goods or services that other people want at a price they can afford. You know, when I was CEO at CKE, we, we competed with, uh, with all of these restaurant chains and we spent literally millions of dollars every year trying to figure out what you wanted so we could serve it to you at a price you could afford. We weren't trying to create burgers for government elites or, you know, or the, the, the wealthy people in this country. We were trying to create burgers for you guys because you succeed in this country by meeting the needs of other people. Free market capitalism is a form of economic democracy where you vote with every dollar you spend on what, what products succeed and what products fail. So every person who produces a product, a good, or a service 
is trying to meet your needs. I mean, think about your local, uh, your grocery store. This is an Amazon warehouse or a shopping mall. I guess people don't go to those much anymore. But think about your grocery store. Now, these products are screaming at you that they have what you want at a price you can afford. And every product on those shelves represents an entrepreneur trying to meet your needs. Capitalism forces you to look out outward to the needs of other people. Your life will only improve to the extent that you meet the needs of other people. Whether you own a car company or a pizza hut, you're only going to succeed to the extent you meet other people's needs. That's not greedy, that's more like altruism than it's like greed. How about socialism? What does socialism do? Does socialism cause you to reach out to other people trying to satisfy their needs? No, socialism does exactly the opposite. Socialism directs your desires internally because you are competing with everybody else in society to get the most you can from a limited supply of goods or services that the government makes available. You know, every socialist country seems to end up with bread lines. Uh, all of these, there's never, there never seems to be enough food because people aren't producing food with the idea of feeding many other people as a way to improve their lives. They're being producing food because the government tells them that this is what they need to do. But think about it, if you're in a line for food, or if it's gas or medical care, whatever you're in a line for, if you're in a line for bread, you're not thinking about the person in front of you, you're not thinking about the person behind you, you're not thinking how you can get more bread for them, you're thinking, how can I get more bread for myself when I get to the end of this line? And how do you do that? Well, in a, in a free market capitalist economy, right, people guide the economy. And therefore, everybody's out trying to meet the needs of the people. In a socialist economy, government elites control the economy. So the way you get more food when you get to the end of that line is meeting the needs of the people who run the economy. Not common people, but the government elites. I mean, think about it. In socialist countries, let's take North Korea. North Korea, people are starving. Do you ever see the picture of North Korea and South Korea at night? I mean, it's like South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree. North Korea is completely black. You would think South Korea was an island if you saw this picture, right? Kids can't get enough. The kids are starving, families are starving. How about Kim Jong-un? Does it look like this guy's missed a meal? <laughs> you know? Or how about Venezuela? You hear a lot about Venezuela these days. I mean, pe again, people are, are starving. Uh, the kids are eating their pets. I mean, could you imagine having to eat your family dog because you just had nothing to eat, or cat, if you're a cat person? Yeah, I don't think Maduro and his friends in the military or his friends in the, in the government are eating their family pets. Now, these people in, in, a, in a socialist economy, the elites do very well because they control the economy. In a free market capitalist economy, we control the economy. You know, it's, what's strange about Venezuela is in 2011, Venezuela was the richest country in South America as late as 2011. They sit on an ocean of oil. They have incredible natural resources and good people. How could they possibly be starving? Well, that's the benevolence of socialism. This is Caracas. Maybe the people out there from California might think this was LA. But, th but this is Caracas, Venezuela. And the people are starving. This is the benevolence of socialism. Whenever you have capitalism, you end up with prosperity and abundance. When you have socialism, you end up with poverty and want. But the real question is, when you create all of this wealth in a capitalist society, does it get down to ordinary people? You know, does, it, does it make it all the way through the economy? Or is it just a bunch of rich people you know, creating a bunch of wealth? Well, there's a, an economist, his name is Angus Madison. And I'm not gonna bore you with the economics, but he was an historical economist. So he didn't look to the future like most economists do. They try and tell you what GDP is gonna be, your gross domestic product, or what unemployment's going to be. Angus Madison looked back to see the history of, econ of economies. And he prepared a chart that appeared in the Atlantic Magazine in 2012. And this shows world history through GDP per capita, going back to the year zero. Now, GDP per capita 
means gross domestic product per person. Why do they use an acronym and a Latin phrase? It's because economists really like to look smart. All it means is economic productivity divided by the number of people in the world. Economic productivity for the whole world divided by the world's population. As you can see, you know, through the days of the Roman Empire, the medieval period, through the, uh, the British Empire, there wasn't a lot of wealth. I mean, there was very little wealth in the world. And then all of a sudden, about 1800, something unique happened. And we saw GDP per capita just shoot straight up. I mean, this is, this is a classic hockey stick chart, right? You, had, you ran a business and you had a chart like this on sales, you would be a rich person in business. This is an incredible chart. Now, I have a son who, when he was about your age, I showed him this chart and he said, you know, Dad, I know you're gonna tell me this is capitalism, but come on, it's the Industrial Revolution. And so I had to show him another chart. This chart breaks down where the economy surged by sector. And you'll notice the first surge comes in the United States. Now, why did that happen? Well, it was actually a very fortuitous coincidence. In 1776, we, um, we, we um, signed the Declaration of Independence. We declared our independence from, uh, from Great Britain. And Adam Smith, an economist, wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, in which he described what a free market economy was and why you would want one. Well, the, founding, the founders of our country not only adopted a representative democracy with the Bill of Rights, they also adopted a free market capitalist economy. And from, in 100 years, literally from 18, 1790, when we ratified the Constitution, to 1885, we went from 13 backwoods colonies on the coast of North America to the richest country in the world. We had the highest GDP per capita of any nation on the planet in the blink of an eye, historically. And we've had the largest economy in the world ever since. What about other countries? Well, well Great Britain, uh, you know, West, uh, Western Europe, or Eastern Europe, Western Europe, had, a, uh, had an industrial revolution. You can see down here that the, there you go, right down here, this is their industrial revolution. Uh, and they also began to have a little bit freer economy when the United States declared independence. But they didn't shoot up until the end of World War II. Well, why would that be? Well, it was the collapse of the monarchies, centralized government, and the collapse of the, of the world's largest socialist state at that point. It was, called, it, was, it was Germany. It was run by the National Socialist Party. As those of you who've taken a, a World War II history course will know, the Nazis were very proud socialists. How about China? China was run by an emperor. Well, China had a little bit of an industrial revolution, and then look, they shot right up and actually, for the first time in history, surpassed Western Europe. What happened in Japan? Well, after the end of World War II, uh, General MacArthur, under President Truman, went in and established a democracy and a free market capitalist economy. Even China, Eastern Europe shoots up with the fall of the Soviet Union, which was at that point the world's largest uh, socialist economy. It was called the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. And then China shoots up, and they, sh they shoot up with red capitalism, which, which isn't even real capitalism. It's just kind of phony capitalism. And they still improved. So capitalism incre in creates incredible wealth. But that doesn't mean the wealth gets down to the people, does it? That doesn't mean the common man and the common woman are benefiting from this. So I'm going to show you another chart. This one, I promise the whole lecture isn't charts. This next chart is from the World Bank. The World Bank went back to 1820 and to see who lived in extreme poverty, right? In 1820, 94% of people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Now the six that didn't live in extreme poverty, probably three or four of them just lived in regular poverty. I mean, if you don't believe that, read a Dickens book. I mean, even in the United Kingdom at that point, or the British Empire, which is the richest country in the world next to us, uh, people were starving back in 1820. And then it declined. This is by 2015. It declined actually to 9.6. It says 10 here, so really single digits, although it averages up to 10. Uh, before the pandemic, it got down to about 8%. Now it's back up almost to 9%. But we've gone from 94% of the world's population living in extreme poverty down to under 10. Now, you know, 8% is still too much. 
But if we're going to reduce that 8%, we need to know how we got here. And it wasn't socialism. You know, if you look at, I, I actually had a techie friend of mine. I, told, I asked him to take the data from the World Bank and do a chart that had the World Bank data and the Angus Madison economic data to see if they correlated. Now, remember, this is two separate databases, right? They were prepared completely independently. But I asked him to combine them in a chart so we could see if there was any connection between the increase in GDP per capita under capitalism or, and the decline of extreme poverty. And, and you can see it matches up. Look at, look at, this is two separate databases that match up. It's almost inconceivable that they would match up like this. But this is the benevolence of capitalism. Capitalism, capitalism lifts people out of poverty and expands the economic pie so that everyone can do better. You know, John Kennedy, uh, oops, no, I don't want to forget, you didn't think I'd quote Barack Obama today, did you? Here it is, <laughs> I'm gonna quote Barack Obama. In 2016, Barack Obama said, we don't dispute that the free market is the greatest producer of wealth in history. It has lifted billions of people out of poverty. There isn't really any debate about this. This is an incredible economic system. Now, John Kennedy, when he was running for president, and he was running for president in 1960 when my dad and I went to visit Mr. Humphrey. About two years later, he wanted, he, contrary to um, what his advisors wanted, and a, 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 an economist named Keynes, he wanted to cut taxes to increase economic growth. Because his belief was that if we had economic growth, that everybody would benefit. In other words, that chart I just showed you, economic growth, Poverty comes down, everybody benefits. His comment, which has been very famous ever since, is that a rising tide, a rising economic tide, lifts all boats. Now, what did he mean by that? What he meant was that contrary to what you hear from AOC or, or Bernie Sanders, wealth is not a zero-sum game. What do I mean by that? I mean that the rich don't get richer just by oppressing the poor. And the poor don't get richer just by the government oppressing the rich. With economic growth, everybody gets richer. Kennedy's point was that you don't need class warfare, which is the core of socialism. If you have, a, if you have an economy that generates economic growth and distributes that wealth. Now, John Kennedy, his, history proved this guy right. I mean, history before him and history after him has proven that he was right. In fact, after they cut taxes, he was assassinated, as you know. But after they cut the taxes, economic growth surged for the first time in a couple decades. We had significant economic growth in the United States. But let, let's, look, let's think about some of the more successful people in the United States and talk about how that benefits everybody. Let, let's look at Henry Ford. All right. Henry Ford came up with a way to manufacture cars, not for kings and queens, the dukes and earls of his day, but for the common man and the common woman. He became very rich. He benefited us tremendously. Or Steve Jobs, to get a little more current. Steve Jobs came up with the smartphone. He didn't come up with the smartphone for government elites or corporate elites. He came up with the smartphone you know, for you and for me. Or Jeff Bezos, roundly criticized for being the richest man in the world. But he got to be the richest man in the world by creating the greatest distribution system in the history of the world. Nobody's ever created anything like Amazon. No state, no company, no individual. And thank God he did so before the pandemic. These people became tremendously wealthy, but they became tremendously wealthy because they provided us with tremendous benefits. They became tremendously wealthy by meeting the needs of other people. Even a guy who runs the local pizza restaurant or your local Hardee's or, or whatever it used to be a Hardee's, I can't remember what you said the restaurant's called. You will succeed to the extent that you are able to satisfy other people's needs, which distributes wealth throughout the economy. You know, throughout our history, self-made men and women, unrestrained by government, have surged forward with innovative ideas and solutions that created jobs, prosperity, 
and wealth for the entire nation. Yes, they improve their lives. But in doing so, they improve the, the lives of their fellow citizens and really you know, the, the entire human population in many cases. These people didn't become successful, by the way, because they're superheroes, you know, perfect in every aspect of their life and their character. You know, most of them are just like you and me. I mean, there's some good, there's some bad, you know, maybe a little more bad than good, maybe a little more good than bad. They succeeded because they had some common characteristics and they lived in a, in a society where they had the opportunity to succeed. Those common characteristics would be risk takers, hard workers, right? and, that, and passionate in their pursuits. And we can be the beneficiaries in our system of their passion and their ability. You know, it, as I said, I was the CEO of CK Restaurants for about 17 years, and today, there's tens of thousands of people working for that company. Some of them are just working to make a little extra money, try and make a little extra cash, like I was doing when I was in school. Uh, some of them are maybe trying to pay for school. You know, there are, there are educational benefits. Some of them find permanent careers. You know, this, this, in the fast food industry, you can actually find good paying jobs. You can work your entire career in fast food. Some, peop, some of them even become franchisees and end up owning their own restaurants. None of that would have been possible. None of us could have succeeded as we have, but for a guy named Carl Karcher. Carl Karcher started in, in 19, well, first of all, he was a, the oldest of eight kids in a family of dirt farmers on the coast of Lake Erie. So, and it was during the depression. And I gotta tell you, being a dirt farmer during the depression, not such a good move. You know, it was not really a good occupation. Carl got to be about 6'4", you know, ate a lot of food, oldest of eight kids, family decided maybe he should move to California and try his luck out there. He moves to California in 1937. In 1941, he and his wife, Margaret, invested in a hot dog cart. They spent every penny they had, $326, had to hawk their car, Margaret had $15 in her purse, which she dug out and gave to him at, at the end. She didn't want to give it to him, but she finally did. They bought this hot dog cart, and over the next three decades, they turned it into a major restaurant business. Now, unlike the great majority of countries, the great majority of people in the great majority of countries in the history of the world, you live in a country where that's possible. You live in a country where that can be done. If Carl had been born in a socialist economy, an economy that didn't respect his freedom to succeed, he would have died a dirt farmer on the coast of Lake Erie. He never would have been able to reach his potential or spread the benefits of that potential to the tens of thousands of people who work for the company today and the millions who have worked for it since 1941. Now, to respect what people like Carl or, I don't know, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, to respect what these individuals have done, you don't have to view them as paragons of moral virtue. Free market capitalism isn't an ethical creed. It isn't a religion. It doesn't purport to tell us how we should live our lives. It's an economic system. And on its own, it can't create a healthy society where we care about each other or where we take care of each other like we should. Businesses are engines of economic productivity. They create wealth. But look, healthy, healthy societies need more than wealth. This is why healthy societies have healthy families, healthy religious institutions, flourishing arts, and other agencies through which people can find love, inspiration, moral clarity, emotional stability. The business community is not and cannot be the prime driver for determining how society meets those needs. What it can do is it can create the wealth that lifts people out of poverty and enables the rest of society 
to help those that remain in need. You know, free market capitalism expands the range of freedoms in our occupational lives while encouraging us to meet other people's needs. In so doing, it creates the wealth that makes possible real charity, not taxes, but real charity, real giving. And it creates the opportunity to succeed for people that are willing to take the risks and do the work. And it spreads the benefits of, of those people reaching their potential to others in the form of jobs, wealth, and prosperity. You know, what, a, what a system. Now, why would this be important to you? Well, I, I think your generation, like every generation, wants to see people succeed. You want, to, you want to lift people out of poverty, you want people to be able to change, you know, from the working class to the middle class or whatever class to whatever class. You want to see people be able to improve their lives. And so I have really good news for you. And the good news is that the system that you've been raised in, the system that you live in, the free market capitalist system, is the greatest economic system in the history of the world. It enables our farmers to feed the world because when they feed the world, they can better feed themselves. It enables our entrepreneurs to clean up inner cities, you know, new apartment buildings, new restaurants, new grocery stores, because by improving their community, they can improve their own lives. It is the best system ever devised for the poor and the marginalized. It allows them to vote with every dollar they spend as to where the economy goes and how their needs are met. It creates the opportunity to lift, to move from one economic class to another. It's called free market capitalism and the American dream. This is Carl Karcher, uh, the young kid who was 6'4 and moved to, from Northern Ohio to California to start Carl's Jr. And uh, at the end of his life, his famous saying was, the American dream is alive and well in this country of ours. You know, I know it, I lived it. Well, the American dream and free market capitalism will soon be yours to defend. It'll be your generations to defend. You know, Ronald Reagan, as a, one of our really incredible presidents, had many, many great quotes, but one that I like to mention near the end of this talk is where he said, you know, if you lose your freedom, you lose your political freedom and all freedom. It's never more than one generation away from extinction. Every generation has to learn how to protect and defend it or it's gone and gone for a long, long time. Freedom is always one generation away from extinction. I told you at the beginning of this talk that I wanted you to know why it was important for me to be here tonight you know, in Charleston, where my wife and I spend the summers up in northern Michigan, so it's a trip. Why is it important for me to be here tonight to speak to you? Well, the reason is because I don't want your generation to be that generation. I want you to have the chance to continue the legacy of freedom and prosperity that we've enjoyed in this country for now over 250 years. May God bless every one of you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. We have time for a, a couple of questions and answers. If anybody in the audience has one, I'll be um, Phil Donahue, or who do you, who's the talk show host of the day that we run around and, and get? Oh, good. This is my favorite. Part. All right, good. Excellent. <laughs> Come over this way and I'll, or here, just, what is it? Would, how would you fix, because I understand how you say like it's like good, like free capitalism, but what about in terms of medicine? Because medicine prices have been gotten up and they're not affordable for everyone. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, let me say there's a couple things I want to say about that. One is, um, how many people got vaccinated from COVID? Okay. How many of you got vaccinated with a vaccine that came from China? How about Russia? How about Cuba? How about anywhere other than the United States? Who came up with the only vaccines that effectively dealt with COVID? It was the United States pharmaceutical community. And one of those companies, Moderna, was a startup by some entrepreneur in Massachusetts. 
Now I'm not saying that medicines aren't too expensive, they are too expensive. But I will tell you that the solution to this isn't for the government to intervene. Uh, let me ask you a question. What is the only thing in the history of, of the world that simultaneously increases quality and decreases prices? Anybody know? No, you can't, you're in the front row, you can't say. <laughs> What's the only thing that increases quality and decreases prices? Think about it, there's only one thing. Starts with a C. Starts with a C. Competition. Competition is the only thing that decreases prices and increases quality. What's the one thing that you know for sure will increase prices and decrease quality? Hand it over to the government. So if you're telling me that the way you want to decrease the cost of pharmaceuticals is by imposing the one thing you know will increase costs and decrease quality and removing the one thing we know will decrease costs and increase quality, I'd say we're on the wrong road. And one of the problems we have right now is government interference with the, with the pharmaceutical industry. Look, if, the, if, you, if you make it for every, every vaccine like the COVID vaccine, for every pill you take that solves a problem, there were 50 pills that got tested and failed. I mean, medicines are very expensive to produce. And how many do you think are going to be produced if people are doing it at a loss? Well, you would say, well, the government will fund it. Then there won't be a loss. Yeah, that's why the vaccines didn't come out of China, Cuba, Venezuela, Germany. Yeah, I mean, they came, they came out of here because we have the structure in place really to save the world in this case. So, yes. Pharmacy pills are too high priced. We need to do something. But the solution isn't that the government takes control of it. That would end up, we, we would end up with no new, no new medicines and they would be three times as expensive. I get that question a lot though, so I was prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Okay. This row is good. So, um, uh, sorry. So you listed a lot of success stories like Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs. But something I noticed is that none of those people were people of color. And something that we need to recognize in today's society is institutional racism and how that affects people of color. So I just, like, how do you, want to, how do you tackle that? Do you know who the first um, female millionaire was in the United States? You, you know, who was it? She was the one who the Madam C.J. Walker. Her, her parents were slaves. Uh, she, there was a, uh, Booker T. Washington held a, uh, a symposium on business in, in Chicago. And uh, uh, y'all knew who Booker T. Washington was, right? You know, famous black entrepreneur. And they didn't invite her because <laughs> she was a woman. And uh, she went anyway because she was a tough woman. And she got up and talked and talked about the benefits of living in a free market how you could succeed in this country, the same things Booker T. Washington talked about. Now, there have been incredible impediments to people of color uh, and women uh, moving forward, I, moving forward uh, in this country. And we, we are, we are, this government is run by people. Our economy is run by people. We are never gonna be perfect at this. It's all, there, I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you that we were going to be perfect. But I look around here, I'm at a, I'm at a really good school. I'm in, you know, I'm in, this is North Carolina, right? I'm in North Carolina in a really good school. <laughs> and, and, at, and at least half of you are people of color and women. I, you know, it's not, it's not like there's no opportunities in this country. And there have been, free, now there have been things like Jim Crow, obviously slavery, Jim Crow, things that have held people back. But hopefully, you know, my generation, we had a, uh, a hero by the name of Martin Luther King who said he looked forward to the day when people would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He was actually referring to his children. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so supportive of that, you can't believe, and I think every, I, I, I bet if you polled that, it would be approved by 90% of the people in the country. So I think there is opportunity. It's never gonna be perfect. It's never going to be what you want. Look, I gotta tell you, being an Eastern European kid who was Catholic and a name like Puzder, you know, I wasn't, they weren't exactly inviting me to Harvard. No, I did have the advantage of being white and a male in those years, but this is not, you know, I, I, got a, I got three brothers and a sister and a bunch of relatives who were not particularly successful. I mean, I think sometimes you have to fight for this stuff, and I, I got a feeling the people in this room are fighters, or you wouldn't be in this room. So I think we're on the right path. Is it ever going to be perfect? It's not. Do we need... 
to strive to make it perfect? Yes, we do. And the student body of this campus, women are in the majority, by the way. Now, my law school class at Washington University in 1978 was the first class in America that was uh, more than 50% female. So. Other questions? Okay. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on some of these uh, largely growing parent corporations that have continued to buy up a lot of these smaller companies um, like PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Luxottica, that oftentimes giving the illusion of choice? Well, a, a lot of what we're saying, well, there's two things. There's two ends to this spectrum. One is when these companies get too big, there's, there are antitrust laws that should be enforced to break them up. That's what happened in the early 1900s under Teddy Roosevelt, where he broke up things like uh, uh, Standard Oil. The other side of that is government policies force that. I'm going to give you an example. There was a, there was, after the economic crisis in 2008, uh, when we had a real estate bubble that burst, uh, and the banks had lent too much money based on real estate, uh, Congress passed something called Dodd-Frank. And Dodd-Frank was a regulatory bill that was supposed to regulate banks that had become, quote, too big to fail, right? Taxpayers had to, had to bail these banks out. So they put in place all of these regulatory requirements so that banks couldn't get in that trouble anymore, which sounds like a good thing, right? You wouldn't want too big to fail banks, and then they fail, and then the taxpayers have to bail them out. What it did was it took all of the community banks and the local banks, and the regulatory requirements were too, were too expensive for them to stay in business. So to comply with the regulatory requirements, they ended up merging into the bigger banks. So the too big to fail banks became even too big bigger to fail banks. You know, now you see very few community banks because they got gobbled up because the community banks couldn't afford to operate anymore. Now you've got companies like PepsiCo and Coca-Cola that compete, 7up, Dr. Pepper, that's a different company, they compete. But when a company gets, gets so big that you have no choices and it impacts prices, the government has a, an obligation to step in and make sure that if, if they've got a trust, that trust is broken up. But I think the government creates a lot of problems for small businesses. It kills small businesses. California just passed a law that's going to kill franchising in the state. Now, those franchises are all you know, people that, in, in the company I ran, they were all people that came in, started, they started sweeping floors you know, or cleaning the restrooms, and they ended up owning four or five restaurants that generated maybe $100,000 a year in income. Uh, they're not going to be put out of business, and all you're going to have left are these big companies like McDonald's, like Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. We're about 95% franchise, but when the franchisees go out of business, you're going to find that we own the restaurants. And so th this, this is a serious problem, and it's one that doesn't get enough coverage, and I'm glad you asked. What would you say has been the secret to your success? Okay, well, first of all, I was being born in an incredible country where I had the opportunity to succeed. I don't know any, I, like I'm telling you, there, is, there literally is no other country in the world where I ever could have achieved what I achieved. There just isn't. Uh, so I think that's important. The other thing was I, I wanted to. I, I kind of enjoyed what I did. You know, you're, gonna, you're going to succeed at whatever you enjoy. I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought it was great. I studied history in undergraduate school, and I thought, you know, lawyers were involved in a lot of the history making in this country. And I respected the founding principles in, uh, in our founding documents, in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Uh, so I, I did what I enjoyed, and I, I, it's, a, it's a whole other lecture is how I got to be CEO of a fast food company. I never even worked in a restaurant. They hired me as the, as the CEO of Carl's and Hardy's to put it out of business. They thought I'd take it into bankruptcy or sell it, because I was a lawyer and the company was, in, a, in essence, bankrupt. I realized pretty quickly that all the, all the workers would lose their jobs, all the franchisees would lose their restaurants, all our lenders would lose their money. So I said, well, what the hell, let's see if we can fix it. And you know, who knew? I, apparently I knew how to fix a restaurant chain. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, okay. Uh, what are some disadvantages to capitalism? Uh, I'm not, I, to the system itself or to people who, who take advantage of aspects of it. I, you know, you can commit a crime uh, and you, know, you should be prosecuted for doing it. I, I can't, as an economic system, I think it's hard to find uh, problems with capitalism. It's the only, you saw that chart shoot up. That, that's, that's not from a system that had a lot of holes in it. I mean, the human condition never, has never improved 
like it improved. This affected your great grandfather, your grandfather, yeah, you're probably your great great grandfather. It affected my great grandfather, but your great great grandfather, your great grandfather, your grandfather, your father, your family. This affects everybody sitting in this room today. That surge in economic prosperity happened here. You know, it spread to the rest of the world. Uh, and that, that's not something that happened uh, because we had a system that had a lot of defects. It's a, it's a very sound system. But like anything else, it's run by people. And people can take advantage of it. You know, people can do things. People, that we talked about monopolies. People can get too much control over a market. And then rather than there being competition, which is what increases quality and decreases price, you have no competition, which means just increased price. Uh, so there are people who can take advantage of it, but we have laws to protect us from that. The legal system is very, very important in a capitalist economy. You've got to have contracts. You've got to have antitrust laws. You've got to have securities laws. You know, there was a time in the 1930s when, uh, when CEOs didn't have to disclose confidential information about their companies. So if they knew that a company was doing poorly, they could sell all their stock and nobody would know. You know so we needed the SEC. We needed the Securities and Exchange legislation that came in place after the Depression and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. So there have been times when people have tried to take advantage, but we, have, we also have another really incredible system in this country. It's called a representative democracy. And uh, we are a young country. You know, young, I'm going to say, yep. So I'm standing for, I'm still moving around, right? I still feel pretty good. I'm 72 years old. I did the math on my 72nd birthday, and uh, I've been alive for 30% of this country's history. That, like, blew me away. My mom turned 100 two days ago. Uh, she's been alive for 40% of this country's history. Her comment was, I remember the 1920s and the 2020s. <laughs> you know, I said, I'm surprised. I hope at 100 I remember anything. Uh, but she, in, in any event, it, we're a young country. This is a young experiment. And this is why it's important for your generation to understand what you're inheriting. This is a young country, it's a young experiment, and it can still fail. But we have two great institutions, representative democracy, where we can step in and vote to change the laws or to change the direction of the company, country. And then we've got free market capitalism, where we can vote with every dollar we spend as to what products succeed and fail. Does anybody remember the Blackberry? <laughs> down here, hey, it was a phone. Everybody loved the Blackberry. This was like the coolest phone. It's like, you know, I remember when, you, when we had rotary dials and then it went to push buttons, right? I, and I was with a bunch of my, one of my son's high school friends and I asked if any of them have ever paid for a, a long distance call and they all looked at me and said, you paid for long distance calls? <laughs> but we had, black, we had Blackberries, which were like this incredible innovation, right? And if government had been in control, if, if guys my age had been in control of making the decision as to whether or not we went with Blackberries or iPhones, I guarantee you that the, the government elites would say, iPhones, those are toys. We're going to stick with the good old reliable BlackBerry, which is why it's important that you guys can vote with every dollar you spend. You guide the economy. You direct the economy, just like you guide and direct the government with every vote you cast. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good system. Uh, you know, like I say, people can take advantage, but hopefully we can address that. How many in here had a BlackBerry? Did any of you students have a BlackBerry? It's only going to be this group up here. Oh, it's just a few. Yeah. I love the BlackBerry. I did, too. That, that's why I think the government would have kept them around. It was a, <laughs> it was a it phone. Was like a really it was cool a phone. <laughs> it wasn't something you eat. It was a phone. In your opinion, what's the single greatest threat to our country right now? Uh, ESG investing. I think ESG investing is by far. Do you know, anybody know what that is? Environmental, social, and governance investing. Say it again. Environmental, social, and governance investing. It's where these large financial firms that own tons of stock because they own the stock, uh, they invest stock for pension funds, 401k plans. It, even if you have a financial advisor, your parents do, they invest your stock. And rather than focusing on companies making a profit, which is really what drives the prosperity that I've been talking about, that, that shot upwards, that was because people are abiding by what's called the profit motive. Where you, where you want to generate a return for investors in a company. The more there is, the more the potential for profit, the more people will invest, and the greater the prosperity that will, that will result from this investment. Capital is what make, makes businesses go forward. ESG investing directs, redirects corporations away from generating returns for shareholders to accomplishing liberal or progressive 
uh, political goals. It, it's a shortcut around our representative democracy, right? Things they can't get passed because they're not popular. These investment firms force the corporations in which they have the major shareholders to implement these policies without any vote. In fact, Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, the largest financial firm in the country, uh, once said that um, he thought that climate policies that he was forcing companies to advocate would require a transformation of the entire economy. Did anybody vote for Larry Fink to transform our entire economy? I, I didn't vote for it. Even if you agree with it, you didn't vote for this guy. I mean, this is ESG investing is a threat to our democracy, our economic freedom, and our individual liberty because they use our money to do this. That's the frustrating thing. They finally figured out how to take our money and use it to accomplish their goals. So I think that this is the biggest threat to our nation in my lifetime. I'd say bigger than communism because uh, Abraham Lincoln once said that we'll, our country will never be defeated from uh, an external threat. If we're going to be defeated, it will be internal. This is right after the Civil War. Uh, I, I agree with that. And communism always seemed like an external threat. ESG investing is an internal threat. Uh, and it's, it's something I, uh, I think is very, very dangerous. Any other questions? Yeah. This is good. I love it when you guys ask questions. This okay, so hopefully I'll word this right. But um, so I guess an argument kind of like for communism that I've heard before is like a lot of people say that capitalism like enables people to get extremely rich and seemingly like extort the poor. So uh, what are your comments about these big giants and like corporate greed as a whole? Okay, so like I said, if, 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 they're, if they're becoming very wealthy because they're providing tremendous benefits to the rest of the country, I'm okay with that. You know, Steve Jobs, you how many people have iPhones? All right. How many people feel bad that you paid 50 extra cents because Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone idea and had them produced? I don't care. I mean, I, so he gets 50 cents from all of us for cut. This iPhone is, this is like an incredible thing, right? I mean, you can do, you can, I guess you're, you're, all, you're all pretty young, but you can't, all of the things you do on your iPhone, we have to, we used to have dictionaries, encyclopedias. <laughs> You know, you wanted to turn on the heat at your home, you had to go home and turn on the heat. I'm, you know, all of these things you can do on this iPhone, all, this is the way, the things that you do on your iPhone, only a rich person who hired people to live their lives could have afforded before you got your iPhone. But not everybody has it. Or Henry Ford, you know, who has a car? I mean, are you glad you have a car? My grandfather, you saw his picture up there. I don't know how he got to the boat to come to the United States. But I guarantee you, when he left his house, he was walking around a donkey. By 1920, he had his own Model T. He was going wherever he wanted to go in relative luxury and taking his family with him and maybe working further away from home than he could have previously. Did he care that maybe Henry Ford made a dollar on every Ford that got sold? I don't think he cared at all because they lift our lives. So people do become tremendously wealthy, but only if they provide us with tremendous benefits. If you become tremendously wealthy by stealing, that's not capitalism, that's a crime, <laughs> right? People in a capitalist economy that become legitimately very wealthy do so by benefiting you. Your life is better. I say, thank God, you know, Bezos came up with Amazon before the pandemic. Anybody feel like going to the store back in April of 2020? I sure didn't. <laughs> and the neat thing is that Anybody in here can take advantage of it. You don't anybody have to. Anybody in there what? Anybody here can make, make themselves a success, right? In, in this economic system, you have a free range of opportunity in your occupational life. In other words, you can meet your potential. Think about this guy with an eighth grade education, a farmer on the you know, up in northern Ohio, dirt farmer in the Depression. You know, who comes back and creates this multi-million dollar restaurant company. Like, where else would that happen? You know, this is the country you live in. This is your gift. You can do whatever you want to do. All you have to do is be willing to take the risks, put in the effort, and be passionate about your pursuits. Time for one more. All right, so what's your advice for a young person just starting out to, to land that first job? 
or to get ahead in the world? What would you, what would you recommend? I don't, you, you, we're heading into a bad time economically. Uh, get whatever job you can and hang on to it. Uh, it's going to be at least two years until we have a change of administration before the economy can improve. I, mean, I don't know if you know, can I take a minute to talk about this? Okay, so everybody knows during the pandemic we handed out $4.1 trillion, right? This is a lot of money, right? Our, our whole GDP for a year is 20, you know, $20 trillion. This is like a lot of cash, and we handed it out. So everybody got cash, nobody could spend it. You couldn't go to a restaurant, you couldn't go on a vacation, everybody was in their house, or you know, they, maybe you guys were younger, maybe you were getting out, but you know, people my age, we were not allowed to leave the house. You know, we, were, we were gonna die if we walked outside. So demand built. People had cash and they wanted to buy goods. But at the same time, businesses didn't know what to order. And, they, and so if businesses didn't know what to order, other businesses didn't know what to produce. And the businesses that didn't know what to produce, even if they knew, they couldn't find any workers because nobody wanted to go to work because of the pandemic and they were getting cash from the government. So we had supply down here and demand up here. Now, any, I'm sure you all at least heard something about supply and demand in high school, but simply, if there's great demand for a product, right, but there's not very much of that product, what's gonna happen to the price? It's gonna go way up, right? People are going to charge more because there isn't a lot of this good, but everybody wants it. Well, that works for the entire economy. With all this demand and really no supply, right, you, you, you're going to have incredible inflation. When Even with high demand, if supply meets demand, there's no inflation. You're good. But when supply and demand are mismatched, you have this incredible inflation that we're going through now. So coming out of the pandemic in 2021, in January, when President Biden took office, Democrat economists like Larry Summers, who was the Secretary of the Treasury under Bill Clinton and uh, head of the Economic Council under President Obama, Jason Furman, Steve Ratner, Democrat economists, along with Republican economists, were saying, don't hand out any more money because you're going to drive demand and, and we don't have any, any supply. Your demand's going to go through the ceiling. Well, uh, he didn't listen. He passed a $1.9 trillion bill he called the American Rescue Plan, and the inflation kraken was released. That very month, wage growth became less than inflation. In other words, inflation was growing faster than wages for the first time since 2017. And then they passed a $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill. They passed a $500,000 climate control bill they called the Inflation Reduction Act, which anybody, everybody knows will not induce, reduce inflation. And now they're going to forgive government or student loans, which you people might all find like a very positive thing. But it's going to put a lot of money into the economy, even further juicing demand. The problem with that is the Fed's out there right now raising interest rates. Why are they doing that? Well, they want to reduce demand. They're trying to slow the economy down. So what, what President Biden and the Democrats are doing while, while, uh, while the Fed's trying to bring demand down, their spending is trying to drive it up. So it's like a dog chasing his tail. You know, you can't, you're never going to catch it. And the Fed has to keep getting more and more restrictive, raising interest rates more and more because there's more and more spending. On the supply side, what are we doing to encourage businesses to grow? Well, the things you can do are you could cut taxes. You could deregulate while the Biden administration is passing regulation after regulation after regulation, discouraging growth, particularly with the energy sector, with oil and gas. And I got to tell you, oil and gas affects the price of everything. You know, there's nothing that you have on or that, you have, or that you're wearing as, as jewelry or your shoes or your socks. Everything has to be delivered. And when it costs more to deliver goods, not only in, if you're wearing synthetics, those, that's petroleum products. If you have some plastic, it's petroleum. If you want to get home tonight in your car, it's petroleum products. So when you drive the when you regulate them and drive the price up, you drive the price of everything. So what we've got for at least the next two years is a, a president who's trying to drive demand while the Fed's trying to pull it down and supply chains that aren't being encouraged at all. So with respect to looking for a job, find the best job you can and take it because the Fed is trying to drive job openings down. We just had the biggest drop in job openings last month in at least 20 years. You, you need to find a good job, stick with it, work hard, you know, and, when, and as you get older in your life, take risks and be passionate about what you do and you'll be just fine. But the next couple of years will be tough. They're, it's gonna to be very tough. 
Andy Posner, thanks so much. We enjoyed thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. You want to say a final word, Brian? Okay. All right. You're dismissed. Have a good evening. <laughs>